Today's message is entitled Breaking Ungodly Soul Ties, okay? And this is going along, of course, with our um, series that we've been on called The Goal. And if I was to give you one hopeful outcome of today's message, it would be freedom. Somebody say freedom. Please put that in the comments, freedom, all right? I really believe that when we discover God's way, we submit to God's way, and we do things God's way, we'll get freedom. <laughs> when we don't submit to God's way, we don't want to do things God's way. We want to do things our way. We have bondage, and that ain't what we want. And so my hope for all of you all who are watching is that we find freedom and we find healing on the inside of today's message. And so today we're going to talk about soul ties. We're going to talk about what they are. We're going to talk about where they come from. And God knows we're going to talk about how to break them. At the end of this, I'm going to pray for you. And my hope and my prayer has been that the power of the Holy Spirit will meet you right where you are to sever your past from your future and cause you to move into who God's called you to be. And so before we get there, I want to lay a Bible foundation very quickly, and I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. How many of you all want to be like Jesus? Let me see by a show of hands. Anybody here want to be like Jesus? I believe everybody who's watching do. Of course, that's what our series is about. We said that we want to walk like him. We want to talk like him. We want to love like Jesus. He is our goal. I know you got all kinds of goals. Some of y'all have relationship goals, and you got your financial goals, and you got your career goals, and you got your, your weight loss goals. But our number one goal as a believer should be to be more like Jesus, to have his compassion, to have his perspective, to have his mind. How many of you all say that that is your number one goal? All right, hopefully by all this preaching, everybody back here got their hands up. Praise the Lord. All right. And so uh, that's what we're about, right? But here's my question for you. How many of you all would say being like Jesus is my goal, even if it's not popular, okay? Even if it costs me something, even if I'm misunderstood or even if I'm persecuted or if it goes against what I want to do, he's still my goal. You know, with everything that's in me, I really want to preach a segment about the lordship of Jesus. I think the lordship of Jesus is like huge right now, because when you raise your hand at the end of a service or somebody leads you to the Lord, there's two things that happen. When you surrender your heart to Jesus, you say, I'm going to make him savior of my life, but you're also going to make him Lord. And the savior part is the easy part. That's the popular part. That's like, Jesus, I accept you and I surrender my life to you. You be my savior. Thank God that he is our savior. That means that he saved us from our sin. He saved us from eternal damnation. Matter of fact, when we accept Jesus, eternal life starts. As soon as we accept Jesus, eternal death ends and eternal life starts. So he's our savior. But he's also our Lord. And the first one is something that you receive, but the second requires a whole bunch of change on your part, that you make him the Lord over your emotions. He's the Lord over my spirit. He's the Lord over my body. He's the Lord over my finances. And what does the word Lord mean? Write this down. That means master, ruler, and controller. That's what it means when you say, Jesus, be my Lord. That means that I'm not going to do what I want to do no longer. I'm going to do what you've called me to do and what your word tells me to do. So you are the Lord over my body, my spirit, my emotions, and you're also the Lord over my sexuality. And so I submit not some of who I am to his lordship. I submit everything that I am and everything that I have to that Jesus is Lord. So right here, um, Jesus, of course, you guys know he lived 33 and a half years and he lived a sinless life. All right. And so for 33 and a half years, Jesus put aside his divinity and he walked as a human being for 33 and a half years. And the Bible says that he never sinned. And so he became sin for us to pay the price for our sin, but he never sinned. The Bible also says that he was tempted at every point like we are. Can you imagine that? That he was tempted with everything. So Jesus was tempted to murder somebody. Jesus was tempted to cuss somebody out. Come on. Jesus was tempted with adultery, fornication, homosexuality, gossip, jealousy, evil speaking. He was tempted at every point that we've ever been tempted in, but the Bible says that he did not sin. I believe there's a grace for us where we can move towards how Jesus was. I believe that that is the goal, and I know all of us might not be there, but I believe that he set the bar there, and by his grace, we'll be able to move to be more like him. And so Jesus, if he didn't sin, that means that um, he was sexually pure. For 33 and a half 
years of his life, he, he was not married. He, he operated as a single man. And for 33 and a half years, he didn't let his sex drive drive him, but he drove it. And I believe that that's our goal, that you are not um, in con- your, your sex drive is not in control of you. You're actually in control of it. And if we're going to talk about being like Jesus, God knows we need this one. So right here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you're there, say I'm there. I believe today's message is not just for single people. I don't believe it's for married people. I don't believe it's just for young people or older people. I believe it's for people, people that live in a fallen, broken world, people who have a past but are wanting to do his will. If you want to do the will of God. Now, I realize (laughs) that not everybody who comes to church or watches us on YouTube really wants to do the will of God, but I know there's a remnant group. I know that we got some radical ride or die people that are like, for God, I live and for God, I die. I want to do the will of God. If I know it, I can do it. If that's you, this message is for you today. First Corinthians chapter six. Are y'all ready back here? Let's rock and roll. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 12. It says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. By his power, God raised up the Lord from the dead, and he'll raise us up too. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one body with her? For it is said, the two shall become what? One flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is with him, is one with him in the spirit. And here's the command of the Lord for all of us. Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a person commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God, and you are not your own? You've been bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary's cross has paid for us, so we are no longer our own. And underline this last part, therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, there's a few things that I want us to know today. If you're ready, say I'm ready. Number one, I want us to know that God created sex. Somebody say, praise the Lord. (laughs) He created sex, guys, and so it's not nasty, it's not bad, it's not wrong, it's something beautiful and holy if it's done inside of the context in which God has created it, all right? Now, if you're watching this at home and you got young kids in the room, you might want to excuse yourself right now and go into another room, get on the laptop, get on the phone, and put a live kids church on them, okay? And so here's my disclaimer for you. There will be PG-13 information that I share with you, but before you do that, I would say this. I have a 15-year-old, I have an 11-year-old, and I have a 9-year-old. And before they hear about sex anywhere in this world, I want them to hear about it from God's word. I want, to, I want them to hear about this in a pure, holy way. I want them to hear about it from God's, God's word. And so I'm going to do the best that I can <laughs> to be able to minister in an age-appropriate way. But if that's concerning you, maybe you have um, elementary kids, you are dismissed right now, but you got to come back because I'm going to be sharing some things that you need. But this is what I believe. I believe that we should be talking to our children about sex in a godly, biblical way. I really believe that. I'm not saying speak to them about things that they're not there yet. I'm not talking about give them the details. But I need my children to know as they come through middle school, um, this is, you're going to be tempted with this. Kids are going to be doing this, but you're worth the wait. You can be sexually pure. God has given you authority over it. It's something powerful about two virgins coming together and consummating their marriage under a blood covenant. This is the way that God originally created you to be, and I want to help you walk through that. So I want to be talking to my kids in middle school and in high school, and, and even my elementary, my elementary kids. I, I talk to them, and I, and I tell them about their body parts. And I don't use these fake names. I use medical terms of this is your body part. So if anybody touches you here, nobody should be touching you here. And if anybody touches you here, you tell us immediately. And then I can come back to them and ask them. Like, I I got one that's a little stressed right now. Hey, is everything okay? Has anyone touched you inappropriately? I think if we have a healthy communication with our kids, then sex is not something that is dirty, nasty, or bad. They understand that it's between a married man 
and a married woman, and it is held with that sanctity for the covenant of marriage. And then they begin to put a value and an honor on being worth the wait. All right. Number two, this is what I believe we should know. Are y'all okay? Okay. I got my audience today. They didn't know what, <laughs> what to expect in my teaching today. Praise the Lord. Number two, God created sex for two main reasons. I need you to know this today. All right. Number one, <laughs> for procreation and for the continuation of humanity. <laughs> Meaning that if man and woman don't come together, then we don't have kids and then the whole next generation dies off. All right. Number one. Number two, he also created sex for the enjoyment and also the increase of intimacy between a married man and a married woman. Somebody say amen. Amen. And number three, I want you to know this, that one of the ways that Jesus honored the Father is that he honored him with his body. So look, guys, when we're looking through um, the book of Corinthians, what an interesting read. (laughs) You know, it's written between 55 and 57 A.D., Corinth is this bustling city. I mean, it's this growing city. And the reason is, is because it has two, two main harbors. One is facing Italy and the other is facing Asia. So it's the center point between the East and the West that everybody was kind of um, coming to. And at the time, uh, Corinth is this melting pot. I mean, there's all kinds of different philosophies, religions, and cultures, and there's a whole bunch of paganism, all right? And so now there's a church in Corinth, and these aren't Jewish converts. These are Gentile converts. And so they're bringing some of their paganistic ways into the church. Paul hears about it. And he's like, listen, I got to do something about this. So he begins to write this letter that we call 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and it's basically to address some of the sin that was happening in the church. And so he talks about the petty division amongst believers and how to settle those. He talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13. He talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He talks about not eating meat that was offered to idols, but this one main thing that he does, 1 Corinthians, through the book of Corinthians, he talks about sexual purity. He talks about sexual immorality because at that time, Corinth was known for their sexual permiss- permissibility. You know, it, it, was, it was known as this sensual city. It was known, matter of fact, um, most of them worshiped the goddess Ephrodite, who was a Greek god of love and passion. They had temple worship to pagan gods where a thousand prostitutes would come to the temple and you would be with a prostitute as a form of worship to a pagan god. So adultery, fornication, even pedophilia, all of these things were actually the norm in the city. This was like normal culture that a man would have a mistress, he would have a concubine, and then he would have a wife just to give him children. This was the normal culture. And Paul is like, "Uh uh-uh, that ain't godly. We're not going to do that in here. And I need to teach you something about your body. And so even there was terms like to Corinthianize meant that um, that was another form, uh, uh, a way of of calling a, a prostitute or fornication was to be Corinthianized. Or if you were a Corinthian girl, that means that you were a prostitute. Literally, the name of the city went along with the sexual and sensual appetite and atmosphere that was created. So out of that atmosphere, Paul begins to write this. And let's look at it again now, because y'all know that, right? First Corinthians, watch this again in in chapter number six. He says, I got the right to do anything. And I know a lot of y'all grace-based believers, you got the right to do anything. That don't mean you should. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so whenever we sin, Sin actually has the mastery over us. It literally, we give our dominion away and we give it to sin because sin is now dominating us. So he says, listen, I can do whatever I want to do, but I will not let anything master me. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Don't miss this. So your body that God has given you to steward is not meant to sleep around with anybody and let your waters be in the street. You should drink from your own well if you're married at home, Proverbs, right? So what it's talking about is that you can't do whatever with your body. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 12 says that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So we should not give our bodies back to God after years of drugs and alcohol and just eating whatever. No, we have to steward our bodies. And the way we give our bodies back to God is actually a form of worship. And so he says, you give your body back to God um, instead of to sexual immorality. What verse am I at? Y'all don't know. The body however is meant, right, right here in, the, in verse 14. By, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead 
and he will also raise us up also. And then he says, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ himself? Shall you take the members of Christ and unite them to a prostitute? Translation, that whenever you sleep around, Jesus is sleeping around with you because he lives in you. So we are literally the extensions of Christ's body. So if I am a part of his body, literally his arm, his leg, whatever it is, what I do, I involve him in. Then it asks this question, will you then take Christ and will you connect him? Because that's what sex does. It connects you soulishly. It connects you to another person. Would you connect him to a prostitute? And I kind of want to extend that word from prostitution to will you connect Christ in adultery? Would you connect him to fornication? Would you connect him into pornography? Would you connect him to anything that is sexual immorality? And then the Bible gives us the answer, never. And you have to come to the place where you say never, ever, ever, never again will I not steward my body in a way that would be pleasing to God, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the body that he's given me. Verse 16 says, do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one body with her? For it is said, the two will be one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord will actually be one spirit with him. And then it gives us the command, flee, fornication, any, sexual immorality, everything that's perverse, lustful, flee it all. And this word flee is actually one of the strongest Greek words. It literally means to run in terror. It's kind of what you would do if like Freddy Cougar was after you or Jason and Chucky or somebody. I know that's old school horror flicks. You know, I don't, I never watch that kind of crap. I don't know how people watch stuff, you know, like that. You know, I got enough challenges trying to be in faith to go in and pay for somebody to put me in fear. But anyway, there are certain things that you would run from. And, and just think of this language, because most people, the reason that they fall into sexual immorality is because we kind of play around with it a little bit. Well, you know, I love you. I love you too, girl. <laughs> Will you stay a, bit, a little bit longer? You know I'm supposed to go, but okay, okay. We're just going to watch this movie. And I got my head right here, and then I got my head right here, and I got my hand right here. And we play around with it instead of fleeing from it. See, the word flee is so strong because it lets you know that you are worth the wait. There is a destiny on the inside of you. There is greatness on the inside of you, and you have to protect. You have to put boundaries around you so you don't, oops, I did it again. Come on, Britney Spears. You know what I mean, right? And so it says flee fornication because all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually, they sin against their own body. Now, I try to find what this really means. I looked at all kinds of commentaries, and I don't know what it means. If you know what it means, please put it in the comments or DM me. What does it mean? I think what it means is that sexual immorality, you mess yourself up. Every other sin, you might hurt somebody else, murder, and th but sexual immorality, you actually hurt your own soul. You actually hurt your own self. You're, you're, you're actually digging a grave for your own self. My God. And verse 19 says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? That means God, God lives in you. And so we want to start more churches. The greatest church that we could start would just be when a person gets born again, we started a new church because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit is in you whom you receive from God, and you are not your own. And that's the Lordship of Jesus. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, what? Honor God with your what? Come on, somebody. Honor God with your what? Honor God with our bodies. Honor God with our bodies. My hope is that God has given us a season here where we've come through the pandemic and we've really had to do some self-evaluation. And my hope is that you're watching this and the Holy Spirit is whispering, it's time for you to honor me with your body. My hope is that the culture of our church will be a culture of a bunch of sexually pure people, married and single, because both have parameters and boundaries and context in which we must live. But my hope is that we will make a church-wide decision that we're going to honor God with our bodies, that we will teach our teenagers that you are worth the wait, our young adults that you are worth the wait, that you have value, that you have purpose, that you have destiny. Do you know why people don't, don't wait and do it God's way? It's because we kind of think we know better than what God does. You know, well, my parents got a divorce, and now I want to try it before I buy it, so we're going to live together. Listen, the statistics and the stats from those who live together, they end up alone because they're taking matters into their own hands. This is all I'm saying as your pastor is that God's ways are better than our ways. 
that he knows more than what we know. And if the creator has created sex to be enjoyed inside of a context, to do it outside of that context will do nothing but harm ourselves, and we have to believe him more than we believe us. Would the church please say amen today? I want to pull out a, full, a few principles. Are you guys good back here? Everybody enjoying this? Praise the Lord. All right. A few principles. Write this down very quickly. Number one, I want to find the will of God and submit to it fully. Here's a few principles that I want us to live out. Please write this down. To find the will of God and to live it out fully. Okay. Many times we say, God, what's your will? You know, God, is it your will that I stay here in Gainesville or Orlando? Is it your will that I go to Charlotte? Is, your, is it your will that I stay here or is it your will that I move to Denver? Is it your will that I take this job or take that job? And you know, it's only okay to pray, God, what is your will when the will of God is not known? See, the will of God and the word of God is the same. So if you ever want to know what the will of God is, you got to go to the word of God. For the word of God and the will of God is the same. And so whenever you find what the word of God says, you no longer pray. Let your will be done because I already know what the will is. And this is something God is clear about. Watch this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Watch this here. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3, it says, it is God's will. Uh-oh, here it is. So I'm not going to pray, let your will be done because I know what your will is. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. What's that? Holy. What's that? Separated. What's that? Set apart. That you should avoid <laughs> sexual immorality that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. There should be a stark difference between how we steward ourselves and how people on your explore page do. So as you're flipping through, we're going to see a bunch of sensuality and butt-naked people. But that's not us because we don't live our life like the pagans do and those who know no God. And those things are attractive to the eyes. We see those things, but we still have a discipline and self-control in our flesh because we understand greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world. Number two, write this down if you can. Number two, you got to learn to look for the exit. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, watch this one here. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, not if you're tempted, but when you are tempted, because we all will be tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Here's what I believe, is that no matter what temptation we go for, go through, look for the exit. If you look around this building right now, if there was a fire to break out, what do you do? You look for the exit. When it comes to sexual immorality and you get yourself in a compromising situation, look for the exit. You get yourself into a toxic relationship, Look for the exit. You get yourself into a situation with toxic, look for the exit because the exit is always there. God makes sure that it's so. Write this down. Number three, you got to fix your focus on that which is godly. These are just principles that we can live out so that we can fulfill this command <laughs> to flee from sexual immorality. Write this down. Fix your focus on that which is godly. All right? Because what you focus on will expand. Listen, if you play violent video games all day, every day, that is going to affect the way you see the world. It is going to affect your heart and your mind. Please don't think it's just the game. And now everything's becoming virtual. What is it doing? It's painting on the canvas of your imagination. Your imagination is one of the most powerful gifts that God has given you to be able to see the end from the beginning. Don't allow the devil to pervert that. If you fill yourself up watching The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, all day, every day. I'm not talking about that to sin. What I'm saying is that you have to know yourself. If you are a person that's in a marriage that you feel like is not going anywhere and you keep, keep looking at new love and the endorphins that's released in new love and you are so fascinated with the infatuation stage of a person's relationship that you're now looking at your 40-year-old marriage trying to find somebody that just met each other and wondering if he's going to give her a rose. Oh my God, you have to give yourself a fighter's chance to not allow this world system to program the way you, I'm preaching better than you saying amen today. You, you can't allow the enemy to program the way you think and the way that you feel your emotions, all right? Pornography, it is actually the biggest trick of the devil in our generation, other than abortion. I really believe that. The biggest trick of the devil in our generation is pornography. 
The stats show that 28,000 people visit a pornography site every second in America. 28,000 people, up, another 28,000, up, another 28,000 people. And they don't understand that they are opening up a door to the demonic. He's grabbing hold of their soul, their mind, their will, and their emotions. One in five mobile searches right now on a mobile phone, one in five is for a pornographic site. There are 11,000 porn films made in America every single year. It is a $13 billion industry in America alone. 90 to 96 percent of young adults are encouraging, accepting, and even neutral when it comes to talking about pornography with their friends. Nine out of 10 of of young people, if somebody else is talking about pornography, they won't even say anything about it. Where are the real? Can we please stand up for what's right? All right. And for married couples, because some of us, you know, we don't believe that bring it as long as we're in a monogamous relationship and it's in a marriage, please. Statistics are showing us that sexual frustration goes way up when you involve yourself in pornography as a married couple. Sexual satisfaction goes way down. And the divorce rate for those of you all who are married that watch pornography together, the divorce rate doubles. Doubles. It's already at 50%. Can you imagine doubling that simply because we're bringing in the world's sensuality and sexuality when God has given us this wonderful gift called sex? to be practiced inside of a particular context. So the Bible says this in in Psalms 119 and 37. Watch this. It says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. And my prayer for you today is that you will begin to turn your life, your eyes away from worthless things, things that cause bondage, things that create generational curses. Pornography right now is a man and a woman issue. It is a sin issue. And I I, kind of want to jump into some things. Maybe I'll do it online this week. Follow me on social media because I want to get to the bottom of this pornography thing. Because those stats, alarming, I'm sure they're affecting the church in a really, really big way. And the one way that you get over a pornography addiction is you got to tell on yourself. Sin festers in the light. You need to tell your spouse, you need to tell your pastor, you need to tell your small group leader and have other people pray for you because all of a sudden temptation, it goes way down when somebody else knows. Number four, you got to make no provision for the flesh, okay? Make no, are you all enjoying this today? If you're enjoying this, please holler at me in the comments. Make sure that you share this message. This is a message that needs to go viral. I really believe that. God has made us tripartite in makeup. We know that, right? meaning that we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body, okay? Now, the body part of us is the flesh part of us, and it ain't saved and never will be. The flesh and the spirit are antagonists against each other. So there's a part of you that wants to do what's right, like Romans chapter 7 is talking about with Paul. Why do I, when I want to do what's right, evil is always present with me, O wretched man that I am. What he's saying is that there's this battle between my flesh nature and my spirit man. All right. And so we have to understand that we are to give no provision to the flesh. Romans 13, 14 says, it says, watch this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision. None. Absolutely none. I'm not going to give my flesh what it wants. I'm not going to feed my flesh and starve my spirit. I'm going to feed my spirit and starve my flesh. And so how can we do this? Here's just some simple how to's. If you're ready, shout at your boy. Let me know if you're ready. All right. I was just talking to one of our Um, up-and-coming leaders. He's single. He's in a relationship with a young lady. They're not married yet. They're just dating. Um, They're in love with each other and all that. And I said, how are you doing? He says, we're sexually pure. I say, what are you doing? He gave me some things that I want to share with you. He says that if we're ever in a room together, we always leave the door open for our roommates to, to, to be able to know what's going on. All right. We don't stay out past a certain time of night. So we give ourselves a curfew because the later you stay out, the more woozy you become and you don't even make good decisions no more, all right? (laughs) He says, we we try to do things with friends. Um, He says this one, and this one's huge. He says, we don't make out. We might kiss, but we don't make out. You know what I mean by making out. You You know what I mean by, you know what I'm saying, making out, touching and fondling, because once you turn that on, you can't turn that off. And I'm here to tell you that when you begin to release those things in your body, you no longer make good sense any longer. You're, not, you're, you're no longer making sense, and your destiny is too important. Now, here's the thing. 
If you are a single person, you should go home and have a conversation with that who you're dating or whoever. Let's say you, you don't have anybody right now. The, one of the first conversations you should have with somebody is like, hey, I want to save sex for marriage. What do you think about that? And some people will lie to get what they want. So you need to give it some time. And this needs to be a continual conversation. And those two things should line up. And if they don't, it's okay. God got somebody better for you. You are worth the doggone weight. Would you holler at me up in here and understand that you have value and that you have worth? And if somebody don't want to pay the full price for you, don't give out discounts. You a Bentley. You ain't a Hyundai. You can't negotiate on this car lot, buddy. This is, it is what it is. I've been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Y'all know this is funny. Come on. Let me give you some, some how-tos as a married couple because married people, y'all need to live sexually pure. There's too much adultery in our land. There's too much flirting with people that you work with in our land. And so the principles of self-control ain't just something that you need before you get married. You need them more after you get married. Would the married people please say amen? It was like back in the day, you would go out by yourself. Nobody want to talk to you at all. You go out to the club, go out to the lounge, wherever you go. You come home, absolutely no numbers. But as soon as you get married, you can't go to the Publix without somebody else. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? It's like, oh my God, the devil. Watch this. The Bible in Proverbs says that the adulteress looks for the precious life. That means that it looks for the born again believer trying their best to live for Jesus. The adulterer looks for you. <laughs> and so you have to have boundaries and guards around you. So here you go, married people. How do you do this? All right. What if you limit alone time with the opposite sex, even the same sex, if that's your temptation? What if you limited that time? Okay. Don't allow yourself to have deep emotional conversations with somebody that's not your spouse. You know how the Bible says it's not good for a man to touch a woman? It ain't talking physically. It's talking emotionally. It's not good for you to be sharing these deep, dark secrets with somebody that you work with while your wife is at home taking care of the babies or vice versa, whatever it happens to be. Speak about your spouse all the time. What if you just talked about your spouse all the time, everywhere you go, every business trip you went on, when you're out at the happy hour everywhere, you're just talking about how great your spouse is. <laughs> you would be amazed at how much the temptation would go down. I know people try to hide their wedding ring like they ain't married because everybody else that they're around and everything. No, you need to let everybody know. I'm already taken. I've already, been, I've, I've already made a commitment here. Say no to social events that will cause you to compromise. You can say no, can't you? Of course we can. Hey, you know, all of the, the, the partners are going out here and we're going to get a lake house and we're going to do this. And oh, no, I'm sorry. Saturday I already got family day planned. I'm sorry. I can't come. What if it means you might lose a promotion? So be it. My promotion comes from the Lord. I will not compromise. Avoid things like drugs and alcohol because that causes <laughs> the Bible talks about being sober minded because when you ain't sober minded, you don't make good decisions. Most, most relationships that we counsel that fall into adultery, there's always drugs or alcohol involved because somebody let their guard down. Mm -mm -mm. Have sex regularly. Come on, married people. Somebody should comment right there. I heard Pastor Eric say, come on, have sex regularly because if you don't, you'll become roommates. And, and intimacy is very important in your, in your relationships. If you have problems with intimacy, get help right away. You're not alone. There's a whole lot of people that we need to go to counseling. We need to get some natural help and we need to get some testosterone shots, whatever we got to do to make sure that that area there, I will not allow a foothold of the devil to come in. And we've gotten through all this, y'all, to get to number five, which is break ungodly soul ties. And I want to read to you um, something that I got off of a website called The Moral Revolution. Listen very carefully. Sex is tridimensional experience, spirit, soul, and body. Anytime you have sex with a person, you bond with them. Dr. Daniel Amen writes in the book, Change Your Brain and Change Your Life. Whenever a person is sexually involved with another person, neurochemical changes occur in both their brain that encourage limbic emotional bonding. Limbic bonding is the reason casual sex doesn't really work for the most, most of the people on a whole mind and body level. Two people may decide we're going to have sex just for the fun of it, yet something is occurring on another level that they might not have decided on at all. Sex is enhancing an emotional bond between them whether they want it or not. One person, often the woman, is bound to form an attachment and will be hurt when the casual affair ends. One reason is that usually the woman who is hurt most is because the female limbic system is larger than the male's. This is what we call soul ties. 
Sex is like gluing two pieces of wood together and the next day ripping them apart. Of course, wood from the opposite board remains on each board. A piece of your sex partner, the good, the bad, and the ugly stays with you and vice versa. And for the rest of your life, you can only imagine what it looks like when you bond with multiple partners. Unhealthy soul ties are often the ramifications of, a, of having partners that you create a lifelong bond through sexual encounters, but with whom you only have a short time relationship with. The bond, a soul tie, remains long after the relationship is over, leaving both sexual partners longing for wholeness. So a soul tie is this. It's like taking these two pieces of wood that are kind of stuck together and you, you come together and it's, and it's hot and it's steamy and, it, and you're releasing all kinds of endorphins and you think that you're in love, but then something happened and the relationship is over. And I don't know if you can see this, but there is a piece of the other piece of wood on each piece, meaning that when it's ripped apart in toxic relationships, this is what happens. They get ripped apart and neither piece is ever the same again. You literally carry a piece of that person with you until that soul tie is broken. Okay, let's handle it. Now, a soul tie, write this down. It is being attached to another person emotionally or mentally, specifically after intimacy. This is not a spirit tie. Okay. Now, I was on the internet. I know that there are some people that don't believe in, in, in soul ties because they say, well, my spirit is with Jesus. You're right. Your spirit man is intertwined with Jesus as a believer, but not your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now, those of us who we have history of counseling, we understand that when people come and they're in bondage, they're in a relationship that they wish they could get out of, they feel like that person is with them all the time, it is what we call a soul tie. There is emotional and mental bondage that's there. All right. Now, your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. All right. And so the principle is very is very simple. So the Bible does not say the term soul tie. You will not be able to Google this and find this in the Bible, but you will see the principle. Um, part of where you see the principle, of course, is with not being equally yoked together with unbelievers. So that yoking is a bondage. Second Corinthians 614. The Bible says that David and Jonathan, their souls were knit together and they became one soul. Now, this was a friendship. So that lets us know that soul ties don't just have to be sexual. Soul ties are anything that you are tied to emotionally and mentally. And some soul ties actually can be good. Like me and Tabitha, we've been married for 21 years and we have a healthy soul tie. Praise God for that, that we are tied to each other financially, mentally, emotionally, <laughs> in every area that we possibly can be. And I don't want nobody to break it until we go home to be with the Lord. Amen. All right. And so you can have a soul tie with a, a lifelong friend. And hopefully if it's a good friendship, that's an okay soul tie. I believe there's even a soul tie that you have with your church. Come on. You shouldn't be able to jump from church to church just because somebody says something or they didn't do what you like. Come on, my kids were baptized there. I was married there. I got counseling there. God did this to, for me in that church. He encouraged me. I didn't know who I was. And now my, mentally and emotionally, I'm all in. I'm not looking. People used to invite me to, to their church, especially when I was in D.C. Hey, will you come to my church? No, I'm completely satisfied in my church. Uh, you do what you do on Sunday. I don't want to go visit. I don't want to miss one thing that's happening in my church. I don't want to miss one word that my pastor is saying I'm mentally and emotionally there. I think that's okay. But I think it's a problem when we have sexual relationships with people that are no longer in our lives, but we carry them with them into every new relationship. And so seven signs that you have an unhealthy soul tie. If you're ready, say I'm ready. You're in a relationship with a person and you feel so attached to them that you refuse to cut off the connection and set boundaries. Might be a soul tie. You've left a relationship maybe long ago, but you think about the other person obsessively and you can't get them out your mind. You might have a soul tie. Whenever you do anything, make a decision, have a conversation with somebody, you feel like this person is with you or watching over you. You might have a demon and we want to cast it out in Jesus name. <laughs> Number four, when you have sex with somebody else, hopefully your husband or wife. 
and you can hardly keep yourself from visualizing the other person, you might have a soul tie. You take on the negative traits of the person that your soul is tied to. You carry their offenses, whether you actually agree with them or not. You defend your right to stay in a relationship with the person that your soul is tied to, even though it's negatively affecting you or destroying important relationships in your life, i.e. husband, wife, kids, leadership. And last but not least, you're in a new relationship, but you find yourself comparing your old relationship to your new one, and you really would love to go back, but you can't. This message is for, for us today. I believe it's a message for the moment. So what can you do to break out? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I laid a big foundation because I really want us to know, I believe faith springs forth from information. Here's the thing. If you're here today, if you're watching this online, it's because God has freedom ready for you. He has healing ready for you. If you're anything like me, I had soul tie after soul tie after soul tie, from pornography to sexual immorality, Thank God that the power of the Holy Spirit can separate my sin as far as the east is from the west, and he can give you a new beginning today. If God has done that for me, and he's done that for many of us, he wants to do it for you. How how, how can it happen? Well, I think the first thing you should do is you got to admit, hey, yeah, this is a problem for me. I have a soul tie. Okay? Then I think you need to do a clean sweep. What does that mean? You should go home and you need to throw away every gift <laughs> that that person has given you. You know, any, any ungodly tie, you might want to delete them off of social media because right now you're still stalking, I mean, checking on them. I, I think you need to come to the place where you allow yourself to move on. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. It's okay to burn that teddy bear he gave you at the amusement park. You know, it's okay. Whatever it is that has a tie on you, this is a spiritual thing, guys need to seek deliverance. I believe that 90% of our deliverance, or the majority, let me just say that, of deliverance happens just because you sit under the word, you read the word, and you do it. All the stories that Tabitha and I tell of overcoming a bad marriage and um, depression and oppression and addiction and all those things, it wasn't because anybody laid hands on us necessarily or because we went through counseling, we read the Bible, and we did it. But then there's some things that you have a hard time getting over where you need somebody's help. And we want to lay hands on you. We want the power of God to fall on you so you can find freedom. Or if you need natural counseling, you can get freedom there as well. And I say that because I don't want people depending upon, I need somebody to pray for me. Pray for yourself first. And if praying for yourself don't work, come on here. We're going to pray for you and we're going to get this thing on. But we need to seek deliverance. All right? We also need to renounce the behavior in any vows that we have made. I will never love nobody like you. 20 years later, go and take that back. I'm sorry, Lord, that I said that, I rebuke that, and I take that vow back in the name of Jesus. Whatever vow you have made, you need to go back and you need to renounce those commitments and those vows. And last but not least, we need to repent to God for any sexual immorality and recommit our bodies back to the Lord. I would love to lead you in this prayer today. If you could just make this a moment between you and Jesus. If you could just put down your Bible for a moment and your note taker for a moment, if you could just clear out the space and tell everybody around you, can can you just give me a moment with my Savior and my Lord? Can you just give me a moment with the power of the Holy Ghost? I want to speak some things over you. I've been praying for this moment, and I know that you're online, but I believe there's no distance in the Spirit and that God is with me and he's also with you, and I've been praying for you as we've come into this moment that God would do something supernatural on the inside of you. I'm talking about the secret areas of your life the secret things that you've been watching online. Um, I hear the Lord saying you have to close the window. You know, David had his window open looking at Bathsheba, and there's a time you got to close the window. Maybe the, the, the window for you is your explore page. Maybe it's your feed. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's somebody at work. The Lord is saying you got to close the window. And I believe that when you make a decision in your heart, God, forgive me, I'm ready to close the window. The supernatural power of God will sever you from your past and give you freedom for your future. And I want to pray for you right where you are. If you don't mind just kind of touching the screen or putting your hands right here or just lifting your hands to the Lord, Father, I ask for you now by the power of the Holy Spirit that you begin to fall right now in every home, in our sanctuaries, in our cars, wherever we're watching this message. Oh, God, you are omnipresent. I pray right now 
that you've always been a way maker, that you've always been a deliverer, that there is power in your name. So in the name of Jesus, we command every soul tie, every generational curse, every wrong sexual act, we come against the spirit of abuse, molestation, pedophile, whatever has tried to define us, and we just give it to you right now. We break the power of it over our lives. We, have not been, we will not be defined by our mistakes of the past. We are defined by our destinies in the prophetic word that you are speaking over our life, that our best days are ahead of us. So we pray, God, right now, and begin to talk to the Lord right where you are. Say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for that sexual immorality or that pornography. Sometimes you just got to talk to the Lord and let him hear your heart. God, the, the way to overcome a sin is to confess it and then turn away, to confess it and turn away. Would you give it to Jesus today? Would you say, God, my body is for you from this day forward? I pray right now that you're making a commitment where your body is for the Lord and the Lord is for your body. And I pray that every tie that has been held onto your spirit your soul, your body, wherever there has been a soul tie, I thank you, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, that tie is now being broken. And I pray that the only person that we are tied to like that ultimately is Jesus himself. So, Lord, by the power of your spirit, I call, it, call him healed right now. Freedom is yours right now. Deliverance is yours right now. Healing is yours right now. Come on. Peace is yours right now. I sense the Lord doing a new thing on the inside of you. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I declare that there is a birthing that's happening in you right now. I pray that the addiction that held you bound even last night will have nothing on you tomorrow, that the temptation of that way, God is showing you the exit signs all around your life. And I pray right now that his grace is sufficient for you. I come against those toxic relationships that have been in your life. And I pray that God is removing that and he's putting the right relationships in your life right now. I pray for those of you all who've been sexually frustrated or you've had this dirty, nasty view of sex, that God will give you a holy perspective of that which he's created done inside of the context of a marriage of a husband and a wife. I pray right now that God is placing back the pieces of your soul that has been broken, that has been ripped away, that somebody else has, and he's making all things new. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, would you all put your hands together? If you just felt like God did something that was miraculous and powerful in your heart and mind, would you share with us in the comments? You know, I think that we have a transparent culture. Nobody wants to judge you. We want to celebrate with you. If you're uncomfortable with that, please email us. We want to know what God spoke to you today. We want to know what God did in you today, and we want to walk this thing out with you. We love you so much. Um, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, I'll pray this prayer with you. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I'm yours. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you got saved. Text the word saved to the number that's on the bottom of the screen. Let us know what God's doing in your life, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in a live church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right. If you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of a live church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.